So, um, as a neurosurgeon, um, I have a different perspective on central nervous system disorders, and in particular, spinal cord injury, um, that I've acquired through years of practice, and now understanding the challenges of translating discoveries, such as what Dr. Anderson has done, into clinical testing, and then hopefully one day something that, that will benefit a patient. And that perspective has really informed me, and I think this is an appropriate setting to make this comment, that it takes a village, to use a, a phrase. Um, it takes uh, basic scientists, it takes uh, translational experts, it takes industry, it takes academic institutions, it takes funding agencies such as CIRM, uh, it takes regulatory bodies, ethics committees, and advocacy groups such as yourself to move all this forward. Uh, we all have a role to play. And when we come together and we realize what the common goal is, which too is to create a therapy, to create a treatment, for some of the most complex disorders that, that we can think of, um, we will benefit from all understanding that there's a role to be played in to advance all this. The other way I think about it clinically is that what we can't do in the brain, spinal cord, and eye is do a, an organ transplantation. Um, now, nothing fascinates a neurosurgeon more than the thought of a brain transplant, but we can't do that. But if you look at what is the proof of concept of transplantation as a therapeutic, you can look here on this list and you can see, excuse me, that on the left side, we started with kidney transplantation in the mid-1950s. And if you look at the history of solid organ transplantation and bone marrow transplantation and how sophisticated that has become and, and what a, a very successful form of treatment for very challenging diseases, you can think that, well, that we, can, we can get some comfort that if we can achieve that kind of effect, not based on a whole brain or a whole spinal cord, but the constituents of a central nervous system, the cells, which is what Dr. Anderson is talking about, that maybe we can achieve some kind of clinical effect as well. So knowing that we can do this uh, for solid organs, and again, it got off to a rocky start, I think, if you look back at the initial history, but it's evolved and it's continued and they have persisted despite all of that because they believe this is one of the ways to treat those diseases. There's a list of central nervous system disorders, all of which have uh, been on uh, under consideration for how we might approach these from a cellular transplant perspective. So the cell that, that we're talking about today is the human central nervous system stem cell or a neural stem cell. And uh, Dr. Anderson has given you a very good um, primer on this cell and in general cell, cell uh, populations that you can think about that might be applicable. The, the key things about stem cells that that make um, basic scientists and, and others interested is that they have two important attributes among many, and that is they have the potential for self-renewal. So you can put in a population of stem cells, and because there's a smaller population within that will self-renewal, you could, through a one-time transplantation, create something of a durable effect. In other words, the cells will survive, and they'll fall under the regulatory control of the host, the patient. The other aspect is that these cells have multi-lineage potential, so they can become the building blocks of the central nervous system. Those building blocks, neurons, oligodendrocytes, and astrocytes are all important for normal function, but they're also damaged in disease and injury. And so if you can think about augmenting the function of those cells or replacing those cells through transplantation, then you start to think that you have the sound footings for a therapeutic, a potential therapeutic. So there's been a number of trials that have shown the way that we can transplant tissue into the brain, into the central nervous system safely. We, we know we have feasibility, tolerability, all important clinical milestones to achieve as you think about some of these things. Spinal cord injury on this list is something that has captured uh, all of our imagination for a long time because if we can reconstitute function over a few inches, a few centimeters of the central nervous system, a very critical part of the central nervous system, you could achieve a benefit. So the scale of what we have to correct is different than perhaps other disorders of the central nervous system that are listed here. 
And because these are, these are injuries that occur in young people, I think even more so, we're, we're dealing with patients who face a lifetime of disability. And if we can create benefits, perhaps not at the very beginning, better locomotor control, but other things as we advance in terms of cellular transplantation, that we will, have, we will have done some good. So the company that I work at is a publicly traded biotech company. It's small. Um, but we've tried to be productive in the last few years, and we've been able to do that based upon co academic collaborations, uh, regulatory interactions, ethics interactions, and so forth, to get the basic science uh, data, uh, like it's been done at UC Irvine, and to think about now how do we get into the human study? How do we begin to ask the questions in the human setting? And we all know that stem cells is a very provocative subject, and um, it's a hurdle to get these first studies underway. And what you see here is a list of the trials that the company has either completed or is ongoing. And I'll talk about them very briefly, and then I'll talk about the spinal cord injury trial and our interim results. So the first one was the first in human, the first first in human transplantation authorized by the FDA of a neural stem cell into the brain. And it was for a disease, a lysosomal storage disease, Batten's disease. And this was started in 2006. And we put up to a billion cells into the brain of children with a fatal lysosomal storage disease. And from that study, we learned that we could do that kind of dose. We could do it surgically. The, so the children would tolerate the surgery. They'd tolerate the immunosuppression for the short time after surgery. Um, and then because this was a fatal disease, we knew that there would be opportunities to look at the reaction of the brain, which is a very critical uh, bittersweet aspect of some of the research that we do. And the three children that have so come so far in the trial, um, their families uh, allowed us to do post-mortem examinations of the brain. And what we learned in addition to safety and tolerability was that the stem cells would survive. And this was a critical thing to begin to establish. And this just shows that we could find the cells not only where we put them into the brain, but we could find that they had migrated to deeper parts of the brain. So this is starting to replicate some of the data that we see in the animal models, and that the cells persisted after we've had the planned stop of immunosuppression. So as you think about cell therapy, it's like building a house, and the first is the foundation, and, and a lot of that foundation is safety. That allows you to the next step to begin to ask the more complex questions. And this is what we got through this first trial, and one of the outcomes was understanding that the cells look like they survive. The next trial that was done, which is the second IND authorized by the FDA for transplantation of neural stems into the brain, was for Plitzitz Merzbacher disease. And I won't go into too much detail, but this is another fatal myelination disorder that occurs in children. In fact, sometimes you can diagnose this within hours of birth. Our concept here was to take the neural stem cells, which we recognize from basic science work, that will become oligodendrocytes and then myelinate. Well, this is, disease is a hypomyelination disorder. And our goal here was to not only begin continue testing safety, but ask whether we could detect signs of myelination, detect the biological effect of the cell. And this work was just recently published when we completed the trial this year in science, translational medicine. And what you see here is a graph of an MRI technique in which the cells uh, in the area of interest, the region of interest in the brain is in red, and the other aspects of the brain are in blue. And what we see by this MRI technique is that in every, all four of the patients in this trial, the regions that we transplanted, we can detect signs of myelination by MRI. So again, another, another brick on the foundation of, of if you will, of, of building this particular approach, which is, can we see signs of a biological effect? And, and we think we now have that with the PMD trial, and we're going to be moving on to a second trial in PMD. But this is particularly applicable because we know that myelination, an insult to the myelin, is part of spinal cord injury. So seeing that we can have this potential effect in the brain helps us think about spinal cord injury as well. So now, the spinal cord injury trial. This is a phase one, two trial being conducted at the University of Zurich. Oh, excuse me. Um, it's an open label trial, which means there's no blinding in this particular study. Everyone knows that you're getting the cells, the patients and the clinicians. And it's a single arm, so we don't have control patients at all. We have natural history data, which is pretty good in spinal cord injury that we can compare to. We've put a total dose of 20 million cells into the spinal cord, essentially identical to the paradigm that uh, Dr. Anderson has developed with regard to the mouse. There was no reason to depart from that. And then we immunosuppress the patients for nine months. And we immunosuppress uh, because it's an allogeneic transplant. So it's 
one human tissue into another human. That requires some degree of immunosuppression, but there's, we understand the central nervous system has a degree of immunoprivilege, so we don't think we need to do the immunosuppression indefinitely. And so it's a nine-month course to help protect the cells at least during the time when they might be most vulnerable to the immune surveillance by the body. It's 12 patients from T2 to T11. And the timing of injury here, we could go into a lot of details about this, but again, this was based upon the, the basic science work led by the team at UC Irvine and Dr. Uchida of when do we do the transplant. And in this particular trial, looking at that preclinical data, we decided that the window was three to 12 months. So late, subacute, early chronic, however you'd like to term that. But more importantly in this trial, what we felt was important was to move beyond just the patients who had complete loss of sensory and complete loss of motor function because we can all agree that perhaps is the most biological challenging template in which to try to measure an effect, even a modest effect, and incorporate within that trial after we establish safety in the Asia A patients, the completely injured patients, to B and C. And that's what this trial will consist of with three Asia A's that we've now dosed and I'll be speaking to. Uh, onto Asia B, four of whom, and then moving into patients who are classified as Asia C. We have a data monitoring committee, and of course we have the typical clinical parameters that we look at in terms of the Asia sensory motor scores. But Dr. Kurt's team in the University of Zurich is particularly good at quantitative uh, sensory perception tests, which are very refined ways of looking at segmental thoracic function in terms of heat and electrical stimulation, as well as evoke potentials. And when, when you're dosing the thoracic cord, you don't quite have the fidelity of looking at motor function like you do in cervical transplants. But we still have the obligation of understanding whether we've changed segmental function, either good or bad. And that's part of the reasons that we did the trial at the University of Zurich. So this gets into some of the details of the sensory, what I'll be taking you through. There's the light touch, which we're probably all familiar with. It's a very coarse measure, light there's normal, impaired, or altered, and absent. But the field is starting to evolve more sophisticated ways of looking at segmental thoracic function, and that is the quantitative testing of or heat or electrical stimulation in which those stimuli can be graded and become a more objective measure of outcome, both by segment as well as looking at evoked potentials from those stimuli. So these are the Asia A cohort patients. There were three in this cohort. Um, they range from 23 to 53 years of age, and they were all dosed uh, in last year, 2011. Um, they had a T8, T9, and T4 lesion, and they are generally between four and seven, eight months after, after injury. The cells are introduced into the spinal cord through a typical standard neurosurgical operation where you expose the spinal cord here, open the dura, and this was the first patient in the trial. And what's remarkable is that uh, when you look at the MRI of this particular patient, you would have thought that you would see much more evidence of external trauma to the cord. And when we look and expose the cord, we see that there's more continuity than what you might have thought anatomically, which is good from a transplant standpoint. The cells are introduced two locations above and two locations at the margin of the lesion, not directly into the traumatic site, but at the margins. Again, based on the preclinical glimpses of work that we have with Dr. Uchida and Dr. Anderson. And the surgeon simply applies a very small needle, a very small cell suspension in each one of those locations through an open technique. So we look at the patients at different intervals at three, six, nine, and 12 months. And we had a, a DMC review of the data at four months um, that tells us whether we think we have ongoing safety in which we can move and continue with the trial. So at the end of six months, we don't have any adverse effects that we think are related to the cells. Um, there's no evidence of uh, increased pain thresholds or uh, abnormal pain thresholds. And the surgery and immunosuppression, which are not insignificant uh, for a spinal cord injured patient, have been well tolerated and those look feasible so far. We spend a lot of time examining the patients very closely, not only to detect a safety concern, but whether we think we're picking something else that might be a signal of a biological effect. And what we've seen now at six months is that in two of the patients, we've seen gains in their sensory levels, and one patient remains stable. Um, we think these sensory gains are somewhat unanticipated and unexpected if you look at the natural history, and they're backed up by some electrophysiology data that Dr. Kurt and his team is also getting. So this is, uh, I'll start to go through the data in, in, in the instance of time. Am I doing okay? Okay. 
This is the first patient in the study, a 23-year-old male who was an Asia A, uh, T8. And you can see the, the classical instrumentation. And then this is the MRI. And you can see here the area of injury. So it's interesting, as I pointed out, that I expected as a neurosurgeon to see a much more traumatized external part of the cord when we exposed this, because you can see there's absence of tissue, certainly within the central portion of the cord. But it gets to confirming what we all know or think we know, which is that there's a rim of tissue, even in the most severely injured patients, that may be preserved enough and amenable to the effects of a transplantation. So in this first patient, we looked at all the different parameters that I just mentioned, um, and he's stable. He doesn't report any changes in sensory levels, and this just shows the Asia light touch examination uh, pre-transplant and at six months. So essentially, no change. We know that there's a, a margin of transition between segments that feel completely normal, and then segments that, in which there's no sensation, and then there's this in-between margin, which in him essentially is stable. So subject two um, had uh, this pattern of light touch. Oops, a little, little twitchy. So at six months, you can see that there's been a change in his light touch uh, examination. And what Dr. Kurt and his team determined with this patient is that he didn't lose light touch perception per se, but he, he reported that, that, that this light touch was more robust, more vivid. And to capture that with the light touch examination by the Asia, Dr. Kurt remained true to it and said, well, it's different, and we'll score it uh, as sort of the yellow, the impaired, if you will, which is not precisely accurate. But then what was good is that we, we had these other backup tests to determine what might be going on. So when you look at the patient's ability to understand electrical perception, this was pre-transplant. Uh, now, post-transplant at six months, it's starting to normalize the electrical perception threshold, so its ability to detect electrical stimulus. So now what we saw by the light touch examination is starting to be backed up by one of these other quantitative sensory measures, which is he's reporting an increased ability in segments below the injury of increased electrical perception. Well, another sensory modality in addition to light touch and, and electrical is, is thermal or heat. And, and Dr. Kurt and his team have a similar test, a quantitative test for that. And this shows that pre-transplant, he had this area of diminished area in the segment. I can't quite make that out, but it's below his level of injury. And then at six months, again, this is now normalized. So what he reported in his Asia Touch examination was a vividness, a robustness that, that they felt needed to be captured. But when you look at his electrical and heat perceptions, you can see that they're starting to normalize. So all of that is a good sign uh, that certainly we're not doing any harm and potentially a sign that maybe something is happening biologically. So when you, in addition to asking the patient about what they perceive, which is the perceptual aspect, you can do evoke potentials. And what you see over time here with the heat is that pre-transplant in, in three months, it's fairly flat as I understand this examination, but as, as the time goes on, you start to see we're picking up amplitudes and latencies, and this is a very, very objective test, the electrophysiology. This is the third subject in the trial, 45 years old, uh, T4 injury, high on the thoracic cord. And again, you see the typical changes in the cord, if you can make them out on the MRI here, of, of what you'd expect to see, particularly with a patient with a complete injury. He is four months after injury when he was transplanted. And pre-transplant, he has multiple uh, segments below in which he has no light touch perception whatsoever. At six months, he's reporting an increase in light touch perception that's probably five or six segments below his initial T4 area of injury. When you add to that the electrical perception, so a way of starting to confirm what he's reporting, is that we also see a transition from essentially no ability to detect electrical perception and now starting to pick up some of those thresholds. Now when you add in the electrophysiology, which is the SSCP, um, you can see that at, at T4, uh, things are very flat, uh, pre-transplant. But that at six months, we're starting to see amplitudes and latencies, which start in reflective of a signal that's passing through the injured area up into the brain. When you look at T7, which is several segments below his level of injury, again, you see somewhat flat, 
uh, essentially absent SACP tree transplant. And now at six months, again, we're starting to see deflections in the signal amplitudes and latencies are starting to show that something, some electrical signal is passing from below up into the brain for them to detect by the electrophysiology measures. So this is the six month data for the three patients in the trial. We have no safety concerns, as I've mentioned so far, which is good as we move forward. Um, but what do we think about the biological things that we're starting to see? And there's always uh, an interest in over-interpreting open-label phase one data, and we have to be careful about that. But there's a risk in under-interpreting as well. One of the ways that you address that is try to look at what we know about normal sensory changes in patients who have these type of injuries. And this is data that comes from an article written in 2011 about what do you expect to see in terms of segmental changes at this time window with this type of injury. And what you see is most patients don't change at all. They don't have a zero change in their segments. But a few patients, very small percentages, probably 1%, will get gains between four and perhaps more than six segments at that time. If you plot out where our first three subjects are appearing, they're falling on this distribution, but two of them look like they're toward the end of the distribution. So that helps put into context how we interpret this data. So from our perspective right now, the trial is continuing. The DMC is obviously uh, understands that we can move into the Asia B cohort now, and they're continuing to monitor the trial. Um, we feel good about the safety profile that we have, and we're very intrigued um, and comforted and enthusiastic about some of these signals that we're starting to see biologically. The uh, fact that they're persisting now um, is even more encouraging. The trial is going to be open to patients uh, who now have incomplete injury, not only to European patients, but patients within the U.S. as well and, and Canada. So I'll just I'll end with this slide. Um, I'm sure that when we look back in 10, 20, or 30 years, uh, some of our efforts now will seem very crude, but I don't think we'll be faulted for having started to explore one technique, a tool that maybe we can offer to repair the central nervous system. And this is not unlike other tools that we're going to be developing, that there'll be cells, there'll be other uh, ways of addressing human disease. But I think it's important that uh, for all the challenges that we face, that we've started to ask these questions. And with each trial that we do, we'll learn more about the disease and learn about, more about the potential intervention. So thank you very much. And I think we're going to take questions. Thank you.